moments to absorb this amazing film. I'm going to ask the uh, other panelists to come up and join me. Uh, Sadia and Dia, Iman, Fozia, Zahra, Walid. Is Walid here? I haven't seen him yet. I know Zahra arrived, so is she in the room? <coughs> Imad, would you join us? I don't think there's a chair for Imad. Can we bring one? Yes, please. While uh, Zara is coming up, um, I th I'd, I'd um, <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit speechless at the moment. I've seen this film before, but it is as as you saw in the film, a film about a movement, about people who are facing extreme threat, and we have here on this panel, Dia Khan who, the filmmaker, and a number of people who are in the film and also people who are facing those threats, the same threats, who are part of this growing movement to publicly declare their atheism and come out as ex-Muslims. But I think there's one thing that we need to take away with us. A lot of the discussion around Islam assumes that it has stayed the same since the seventh century. And the fact is that I, I believe what we're saying, I'm going to ask the speakers if they believe this to be true, is that <clears throat> along with growing fundamentalism and this movement as a reaction to it, we find that the spaces, that the social spaces that might have been available for perhaps private free thinking or atheism or even sometimes public atheism. Um, have we been, we haven't been joined by Zara, have we? Uh, I hope she will join us because she's from Turkey, and Turkey is a place that had a, has a, an officially established atheist association. It's long a secular state. We have uh, two speakers, Fozia from Pakistan, Sadia of Pakistani heritage. We have Walid from Palestine. We have Imad from Morocco. So we have people who come from states where atheism is legal, and we have people who come from states where apostasy is a crime threatened by death. Welcome, Zahra. Is there, is there a chair for Zahra? Yeah. <laughs> One of our speakers, as Mariam explained this morning, couldn't come. Uh, he was stopped by security in Egypt, uh, and he was uh, the first declared atheist in Egypt. So I'm going to kick off, actually. I know you will have a lot of questions, and we'll make time for them. I'm just going to get out my... my uh, time, uh, timer. Um, but uh, I think we're going, what I'm going to do is um, ask Dia as a filmmaker, and then later Sadia and Fozia also, um, when I didn't realize until I saw it again that Fozia is actually in the film um, and Imad to talk briefly about their experience of what happened in the aftermath of the film. Dia, if you'd kick that off, please. Uh, well, so I was um, very aware of Maryam Namazi's work uh, for many years and wanted to do something around um, her activism. And the more I started looking into this topic of, of ex-Muslims, I was absolutely stunned by the fact that not only, well, I've always been told about the amount of people that are converting to Islam, or reverting, or, or whatever the accurate term is. Um, but what I found that really surprised me in the process of making this film was realizing that there are 
millions of people that are actually leaving the faith, and I didn't realize that. And so I wanted to find out what that actually means in the personal lives of people. Um, and the process of making the film was very, very difficult emotionally, coming across so many incredibly hurt people, so many people who were suffering and having to suffer in complete silence if it wasn't for people like Miriam's group uh, and, and a very few other small um, groups around the world like you know, Fazia's work as well in Pakistan and people in other countries. So the reaction to the film, which is what your question actually is, the reaction on my end of it has actually been surprisingly um, positive, to be honest. Um, I have received countless emails from particularly young Muslims in this country who were not aware that this population even existed. And the fact that they're being treated in the way that they're treated, um, I guess, was a big surprise to a lot of young people growing up here. Um, I'm trying to think. Some of the negative responses were, was the, somebody said earlier, was, was some of the Twitter reactions were, were sort of awful, but that's to be expected, I suppose. And then in the aftermath of the film, I found out that before it had come out, there were active WhatsApp and email campaigns against the film before it came out, warning people not to watch it. And apparently one of the messages was, to parents saying that if you have children or young people around you who might be vulnerable and who might be doubting or not be very secure in their faith, please ensure that they do not watch this film. So I thought I, that, that's just such a bizarre campaign to be going around. But so, so that was one of the, the, the ones, responses on the negative end of the spectrum. Thank you, Dia. Sadia, you featured in the film talking very movingly about your brother, and you're active on issues around honor-based violence, forced marriage, FGM, and so on. Um, how, have you, how did you handle it, going so public? It did, make me, um, it did make me feel quite vulnerable. Um, uh, and I, f I felt quite... Um, naked in a way um, because it is a very personal thing to tell people um, you know uh, it's a very British concept you don't talk about politics or religion in polite company um, and that's all I have to talk about because <laughs> that is me um, but it did make me feel very vulnerable um, because after leaving my family um, I was very very private um, about uh, my lifestyle and all of a sudden it was going to be in the public domain um, and I was always very careful about what my actions, what reactions my actions would have as a lot of brown women are expected to, to do um, so yeah it did make me feel quite vulnerable um, but it, it hasn't shut you up. You've gone on being active. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because it's it's necessary, you know. Um, and something that I, I learned through Miriam and Dia and the amazing women that have been involved in this kind of work for forever is that if you have a position of privilege, and I'm not talking about financial privilege, but I mean that you are safe, which I am. Uh, you know, I've been... Uh, I've, I've spent a long time making sure that uh, my home is secure, my life is secure. So now I am in a safe position. I feel like it's my responsibility to speak for those that aren't safe, that are still um, shackled by their families, their societal expectations, which I am now free of, but I understand. Um, so it's, it's very much something that I feel like I have to do. Do you want to talk about some of your public activism since um, the film? So largely, my, my, uh, my kind of area that I've uh, focused on uh, for many, many years has been around uh, honor crimes, uh, forced marriage, and kind of harmful traditional practices. And it does have a link to apostasy, you know, one of the, one of the main reasons, not one of the exclusive reasons, but one of the more, 
more popular reasons that families do abuse their children uh, are because they have chosen to believe something different to what they have expected them to believe. Um, so the work kind of goes hand in hand, uh, the Council of Ex-Muslims and the work that I've done for many years. But um, yeah, I, I guess I've just done more activism around that kind of stuff and been more public, um, regardless of the backlashes. Now, <laughs> and, and you're continuing to do um, work as a, as a spokesperson yes. for the Council of Ex-Muslims as well. Now, Imad is active here in uh, Britain as well, and you saw him briefly in the film actually doing, um, uh, uh, as a volunteer, doing rescue work, um, and people who've worked on violence against women and LGBT issues and so on know that this is core work of movements which, uh, you know, have to support people who are not only facing violence from the state, but facing violence within their families. But Imad, um, w I don't think was really introduced for his activism before the Council of Ex-Muslims, that you were the first declared atheist, setting up an atheist organization in Morocco. Yeah. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about that um, and your work there? <clears throat> yeah, um, um, I founded the Council of Ex-Muslims of Morocco in uh, 2013, and um, it was the first openly um, non-religious organization in, in a country where Islam is a state religion. Um, the, the council was basically just, you know, a scream of a of lot of people, you know, a lot of uh, non-religious people in Morocco that we exist because um, the Islamist narrative in Islamic countries is always those people don't exist. Where are they? And um, the Minister of Justice was asked, I think, in 2008 about, um, you know, a freedom of conscience and uh, freedom of expression. And he said, well, there, there are, nobody, you know, leaves Islam, so, you know, there is no issue. And of course, this is not true. People can't come out because of the whole stigma and the taboo around leaving Islam. And even, you know, just questioning any aspects of the Islam, the official institutional Islam, can uh, put people in a lot of trouble. And um, so it was that, it was just a scream to say that we exist and here, here are our positions. And um, uh, we held um, you know, press conferences and we held debates with people from the uh, superior, Supreme Council of Ulamas of Morocco, which is the um, um, official fatwa body that is supposed to tell Moroccans what Islam is on what they should do and what they should not do, um, and they, they called us. The, they said that we we should go to a psychiatrist hospital and uh, we're sick, etc. Uh, three weeks after we founded um, the Council of Ex-Muslims in Morocco, um, the, this Supreme Council of Ulamas uh, issued a fatwa saying that people who leave Islam should be killed, and um, in their definition. A Napo state is not someone who is a Muslim and chooses to leave Islam, but anyone who was born from a Muslim father. So that was even, you know, um, that was their uh, definition. And it caused a lot of uproar. And um, uh, of course, the um, Supreme Council of Ulamas is headed by the king, um, Muhammad VI, and uh, he has in his in its ranks uh, the Minister of Religious Affairs, etc., etc. Um, I think that it, it's good and bad. Um, in, in one sense, he made, um, I think, uh, a lot of people in Morocco and in North Africa in general, there's more awareness about people who are not, you know, who leave Islam. And this is something that is becoming quite, a lot of people talk about it. And every Ramadan, people know that there are people who's gonna, like, they're gonna, uh, come out in public and eat in public, even if they're going to be in prison, etc. But on another hand, because of the the media didn't like um, cover it as much, and um, there are uh, harsher and harsher sentences for people um, who do acts against Islam. In July 2015, the two houses of parliament in Morocco have passed a law uh, that eating in public in Ramadan 
for the sake of promotion or internet and all that is now punishable for up to five years in prison, which was before just from three months to one year. Now it is more any publication that defame, insults Islam or questions Islam, the, the word is mujadala, is questioning, not even insulting, just questioning Islam, questioning monarchy, questioning the uh, Western Sahara issue, is punishable up to 10 years in prison on the internet, a post of, in Facebook post can take, And Morocco you know. is often seen as a moderate Muslim country whose laws we should adopt in terms of family law and so on. So I think it's very significant to look at um, the restrictions on people uh, in Morocco. Fosia, you actually founded an atheist and uh, association in, in Pakistan where apostasy is punishable by death and blasphemy is punishable by death. Yes, uh, I founded it in uh, 2012, and the name of the organization is Atheist and Agnostic Alliance Pakistan. Yes, it's really crime in Pakistan. Uh, you cannot uh, ask questions over religion in Pakistan. Uh, it's like uh, while you have 98% population that is Muslim uh, in Pakistan and uh, rest of minorities, and even we are not in the minorities, no one is ready to accept atheist or uh, agnostic people, they are even minorities. So it was really needed in Pakistan. Uh, no one was there to help people. Uh, when uh, I remember when I uh, changed my mind and I started reading about religion and especially Quran, so it was really difficult for me uh, to ask question. I even didn't know where I should go and where uh, to whom I should ask uh, the questions because it is uh, never allowed to raise questions over religion. So that's why me and my husband, we thought we must start an organization that can help people. And uh, yes, we started it in 2012 in Pakistan. And uh, for me, it brings so many problems and difficulties. As uh, many of you know that uh, my family have been boycotted me and uh, the social boycott I have faced uh, lost my daughter and job and work and all, everything. I mean, uh, if you are atheist in a, uh, in a Muslim country, then uh, you have to uh, stand up alone and you have to travel alone. So this is what I faced in Pakistan, yes, after starting this organization. But yes, uh, we have done and uh, we did it. Because if uh, everyone will be silent, then uh, how people can know that we really exist. So our existence to tell the people that yes, we exist and it is really important to tell the world that yes, we are here. And it's not like that many people still think in Pakistan, what is atheism? What is agnostic? What does it mean? And people really still, people don't know about it because you have no concept in Pakistan. It is such a one way road, 98% population that is Muslim and you have only Muslims. You, uh, when you uh, are born, there is always a tag on you that yes, the parents are Muslim, then you are also Muslim. It is so uh, weird for me. So yes, uh, we started and we help people, but yes, we have lost so many things. I think uh, I suffered a lot because of this, yeah. But you're still going. Oh yes, I have to do it. <laughs> I have to do it and I will do it continuously, yeah. It shouldn't be stopped, well, yeah. Walid, you live in Palestine, or lived in Palestine, now you have had to leave and go to France. Um, so you lived in a country under occupation, but you were jailed by the Palestinian Authority. Is that correct? Yes. So you have f faced many forms of oppression. And I'd just like you to uh, tell the audience something about your experience of coming out as an ex-Muslim and then being jailed for it. Um, my story started in 2010. I, before, I had a blog. Then in 2010, I was arrested by Palestinian theory, not by Hamas, because I was living in West Bank. Because many people make saying I was uh, arrested by Hamas, but no, I was arrested by Palestinian. A theory in Ramallah. Uh, I spent a month in jail. First four months, it was just like threats, uh, uh, just like asking questions about 
who finance my atheism. Because for them, if you lift Islam, that you should be by somebody. Not, it's not, uh, they don't think that it could be on choice. Or always it's a uh, choice. So after, after four months, I, I was in uh, military because even I am civil. When I ask them why it's military, they're saying, oh, because what you did, it's effect on all Palestinians. Military Palestinia. tribunal. You yes. were up before military tribunal. Yes. Uh, so it was 10 months in jail. And then after I, I left Palestine. But during that, uh, during that month, I discovered many things about law. F uh, first, in my blog, I was just criticizing Islam or speaking about f my debate in Islam. But in law, because Palestinian theory uh, declared themselves like secularism. And that's what I thought, because even in our history, there is many, athe many atheists, many even open atheists. So nobody was care for them. Till we dis I discovered it was the second article in, in the law, it was like uh, Islam is the main resource for justice. Uh, so it was no choice now. And after these 10 months, I was realized because I didn't go to jail, I was in special service center. Uh, and in that time also was for Eid and uh, vocation after Ramadan. So I, were, I was realized that I have to go every day to in the police center to sign to prove that I didn't leave the country. Even with the pressure of international pressure was on the government, uh, Palestinian government, but was for nothing. Or maybe keep them silent. They was saying, as you know, they uh, use it like they arrested me because they want to protect me. If if, the, if it's true, that's why I I'm going to court or something like this. And this use it till now. What happening in Mauritania, for example? What uh, they saying that they arrested him because they want to protect him? What is not true? And eventually, you had to flee and go to yes. France, where you set up the Council of Ex-Muslims in yeah. France. Um, I, so I think what we're seeing is that even governments that are not the hardcore Islamist governments for like me, Saudi Arabia, Iran, yeah. and so on. For me, uh, for me, it's not, the problem, it's not even only with the government. The government have this, uh, this thing from the people. Uh, we, uh, the people even don't accept atheism. That's why even the government will follow. I will not defend the government, but the government is, exists from the people anyway. For example, what happened this week with the uh, so young girl for Minijib, uh, 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 what happened with her, it was by, uh, by pressure of people in social media. And then she was re uh, realized uh, by Saudi. I don't defend anyone, but uh, I know all the same. But I mean, that's, it's with, with the people and with the government also. For example, many of us, they, they, don't, have, uh, they don't go to jail because of government, but they got killed by people, by their neighbor, by everything. This is our, uh, our uh, problem with society and government. Zara, I come to you last because you're from Turkey, and Turkey has a very long secular tradition. Um, uh, and in fact, the Islamists have been attacking uh, Turkish secularism as a form of um, authoritarianism as well, and perhaps parts of it were uh, authoritarian, but now, there's an Islamist government, and I'd like you to talk about the experiences that you've had, both in being able to set up a formal organization quite openly, quite publicly, but the, the threats that you are currently under. Yeah. Um, as you know, before Ataturk, Turkey was uh, like an Arabic country. Uh, after Ataturk has changed lots of things in Turkey, Turkey was a modernist uh, country. But there was always people who didn't want to uh, modernize and they still have the uh, Islamist mind. They were sleeping actually, I'm seeing like this. They were just sleeping. They just pop up as uh, early 19s. They burned some hotel because there were some secular people. It was Sivas in Madmak. Uh, even on that time, government didn't do anything. They just watched. So that people uh, now just wake up. 
they were underground, but they are just feel braver now because of the AKP and especially Erdogan. Uh, so they just wake up now and they want to uh, have their revenge actually, because it is for them is revenge. Uh, they said we didn't want to change, Atatürk changed us. Uh, we were always Muslims and Atatürk made Quran uh, the, because it was Arabic, he has changed the language as a Turk, Turkish language because he wanted to know what you are reading because when you are reading in Arabic, your uh, language is Turkish, so how are you going to understand what you do read? For them, Atatürk was the evil because he did this. So why they see it as a danger because when you do read uh, in Arabic uh, language, you don't understand what is writing in it. But when you are reading in Turkish, you do see what jihad means. And if the Islam is really peace uh, religion, or it is writing uh, some bad things and just uh, telling you to just kill who is not Muslim anymore. So uh, they didn't want to open this. Uh, and now, because of the Erdogan, I'm so feeling so free, you know, you cannot say these things in Turkey. <laughs> but there is video, it's nice for me. Okay, I'm still going to speak. Uh, Erdogan and the new government is talking about, because of the laicity, people are not uh, leaving their religion freely. Uh, because of course you cannot leave your religion freely because uh, laicity tells you, you cannot cut someone else's head because uh, he or she is not Muslim. So if they want to leave their religion freely, <laughs> I guess it's uh, democracy and uh, laicity is better, so we will still have our head on our body. Uh, and even in the school now, uh, they said um, Darwinism uh, shouldn't be in the book because uh, children are so small and they have not enough philosophy and mind for to understand that theory. But uh, they are teaching the jihad lesson because they have <laughs> enough philosophy and enough mind to understand what jihad is. Jihad is fighting for Islam. So they, are, they want to teach the children why and how to kill the people. And it is normal for the children, but learning the uh, Darwinist things is dangerous for them. And um, uh, when uh, you are at the bus now, if you are wearing your shirt or your little skirt, uh, they are kicking the woman's face and they are going to the police station and they said, I didn't like the way uh, that she, is, she was wearing because it is against the Islam. And because of the government gave this uh, courage to them, uh, there is lots of people are now doing it because they are going to police station and they are just, they just let them free. Because that's slowly, slowly, they want to change your wearing. They are talking about, as a woman, you shouldn't uh, put uh, red rouge because, uh, I'm sorry for my uh, language, it is, uh, you will look like a slut. And when you are uh, wearing the high shoes, this the noise of the shoes is bad because a uh, man wants to do sex for, with you. So uh, this is my body. I will choose what to wear. I will choose uh, my rouge. It is none of uh, anyone else's business. It is, uh, we are not honored to men's. Uh, we are honored to our lives and it is our issue. We don't need to protect by government, or we don't need to protect by man or religion. I think that's a very important point, that we are facing, what we see here are people facing threats from the state, increasing authoritarianism. The issue of um, uh, atheism is being used as one of the major threats by countries that are under threat from Islamist terrorism. And what they're doing is they're going after the atheists as a source of the threat. And I think we see that across the board. And as Zera said, and others have indicated, it's opened up space for vigilante action as well, for people to uh, 
you know, take up arms on behalf of uh, uh, Islam and to either f make complaints or, as Bunya experienced, to actually take up machetes and actually go out um, and kill. So I'm going to throw open the floor now for questions to the speakers. Um, if, uh, you may have comments as well, and please make them, but keep them short because I'm sure people have things to say. I can see one hand over there. Um, yeah. And if other people indicate, okay, I'll take you next after that. And please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Jean Romanowski. Um, I was just, this isn't directed at anyone in particular, but I was wondering if the reason for the hatred of atheism comes from a place of fear from religious people of atheism as a concept or atheists as people for what they might do in a society. Should we take a couple of questions? You're, you, you're saying that the, the reason given is that the fear of religious people of what might happen in if society. If they let Do atheists exist correctly? in their society, I'm wondering, does it come from, could it come from a place of fear as well as hate? I think so. Can I just very briefly? Uh, I mean, j just, you know, what I was saying earlier, the reaction to the film, the fact that, you know, before anyone knew what the film was going to be about, other than it's about atheists within the Muslim context, the fact that all these various campaigns were going around saying, you know, make sure people around you don't see it. So clearly, they're, they're, I think people were nervous about the kind of impact that these incredible people's stories might have on their own children or people who might be questioning. Um, and then if it's not fear, then why are so many governments persecuting um, people like this, it, it doesn't make any sense. And, and speaking of terrorism in Saudi Arabia, you know, in Saudi Arabia, a, Saudi Arabia, atheism is considered worse than terrorism, mm. which, you know, go figure how any of these people are worse than ISIS, you know, it makes no sense. So I think it's absolutely fear, at least that's my opinion. And throughout, uh, there's, there's a kind of intentional othering in, in uh, religion, that anybody that doesn't have the same ideas as us is not right uh, or they're harmful. Um, so that starts from a very, very early age in most religions, that kind of brainwashing from infancy almost. So as adults, anybody that doesn't have the same ideas, you're naturally going to think that they are harmful, they are disgusting, they are less than you and your clan. Uh, I have uh, been wondering about this since I have been become, my name is Swami Vigyananand. Good morning everybody and thank you for taking the trouble to attend on a weekend. Uh, uh, I have been always, uh, this question is rising in my mind every time, uh, since I have become aware of this ex-Muslim movement because it sounds to me very strange that why do you identify yourself by something you have left as ex-Muslims. Why don't you just do a 75-pound poll deed and change your name to something, it, it, something secular like a sky or a bird or a tree? That was the first thing. Because to me, it looks like you have left a house, but you still got the door, door knob of the house or the, what do you say, the foot plate of the house nailed on your forehead. That's, that's a good that's question. That's very paradoxical. I that was my comment. Thank you. Okay. That's, uh, there's a clear answer to that, I think. Yes. Uh, for me, uh, for many reasons, we keep, uh, I keep ex-Muslim, uh, to say ex-Muslim. Uh, first, because to be ex-Muslim is a problem. When it's not a problem, let it, uh, we can defend ourselves like what we are. And ex-Muslim, especially here in Europe, because European people think that everybody coming from that area, he is Muslim. Even they didn't, don't think that maybe he's Jewish, he's Christian, just Muslim. You look lo, uh, like uh, uh, Arab, lo, you look like uh, you have Arabic name, so you're already Muslim. No, we, we, ha we are exist. There's people live, born Muslim and live Islam. For this reason, I keep defending myself ex-Muslim. I would like to. Uh, actually, um, as you all can see, we didn't choose to be a Muslim because of the country that we were born and because of our family, 
they choose our religion. If uh, they didn't put any religion to me, I would be atheist just naturally. So being ex-Muslims is just because of the family. It is the same for the Christianity. And saying uh, ex-Muslim, I never uh, put this name up for me because I never felt as a Muslim. But saying ex-Muslim is just showing even we are under danger, yes, we are still here. That's why using ex-Muslim is perfect words. Would you like to comment yeah. the specific reason that... Well, I think we, we didn't really choose the ex-Muslim term. You know, when you go to Islam, from the very beginning, there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books all around the sin of leaving Islam and how bad it is and what should we do to apostate? Should we just jail them for life? Should we cut, you know, their limbs or should we, you know, throw them from high building, etc.? And I think is the Islamic theology that created the apostate term and, you know, they've, you know, kind of um, uh, created all this uh, problem that we face today. People have been killed as, you know, since Islam started, people have always been killed for leaving Islam. People have been skinned alive or, you know, jailed until they, they, they died or, all that. So um, I think we, we, we might have left the house, but you know, for a lot of people, it hasn't been without damages. It hasn't been, you know, people have paid, you know, a high, high cost. And many people have paid their lives for, for living Islam. So I think um, in this atmosphere, I think it's very important to stress that um, we are from a Muslim background and we left, and there are people who are leaving because I think there are so many people who doesn't know about this movement, doesn't know that you can leave Islam. When I was a kid and I was in a Quranic school, I never knew I could leave Islam. And I think a lot of people don't know that they can leave Islam. And when I spoke to a lot of people on, on the internet, on real life, and I told them, well, actually, I've left Islam, it's like a revelation for them. Oh, can I? Because I don't like it that much, but I didn't know you can leave. And um, th this is, it, it takes us back to the other question where um, a lot of sectors in the, the um, Muslim communities in Islamic countries have convinced people that Islam is, is at risk and that there is some sort of hierarchy that pious Muslims, practicing Muslims, even here in the UK, uh, you know, have some sort of higher status than people who are not practicing or people who are just Muslim, you know, by just birth, etc., etc. So whenever we have someone on the TV, actually, oh, he's a practicing Muslim, or she is a practicing Muslim, so maybe she's, you know, has, you know, more credibility to speak than someone who's not. And I think this is what we find all people from Muslim background have things to say, and they can criticize, and they can speak about, you know, Islam and the human right abuses in Islamic countries. And that there are apostasy laws and blasphemy laws that are there, so it makes visible that people have not, are not just atheists from any background, but actually that they are standing there, as, as Imad said. Um, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Darren Southcott. Um, I believe one poll from Saudi Arabia showed that as many as 20% of um, people were irreligious, which was very surprising to me. We often talk about the different approaches towards Islam reform or non-belief. So I wondered if the panel could speak about how, how big is the community of non-believers in Muslim countries? We don't have any visibility, but amongst your, from your experience, how big is that community? And is that the best prospect to challenge Islamism in the future, like decades into the future, if that community can grow? Do you believe that's a better prospect than seeking to reform fundamentalist Islam? Well, I, may I use my position as a chair to just make a comment that I think, I, do, I think fundamentalist Islam, as all fundamentalist religions, has to be opposed, and individuals may reform, but the move, you know, we don't talk about reforming Nazism. So I, I'd say Hindu fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Muslim fundamentalism, we oppose those. Um, 
but we create the space. And I think your question is a, is a very valid one. I mean, how do you feel uh, about Pakistan no, and when the space I, for... Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, when I see religions uh, wherever, it doesn't matter it's in Pakistan or it's in uh, UK or wherever uh, in the world. So for me, I think religions uh, are the same. It really creates boundaries uh, around your lives and you are really stuck in those uh, boundaries. And uh, a human being, I mean, you cannot uh, get that much space uh, that is really needed in your life. So you cannot fulfill with those uh, uh, life strategies and you cannot spend your life as you really want. So for me, uh, I think if I see uh, the religions in the world like Islam or uh, Christianity, Jew, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Hinduism, yes, so for me it's really same, so if we talk about the reform, so for me it's not uh, a problem, I mean anyone can spend their life or they can choose religion whatever they want, they can spend, they can be Muslim if uh, they want, they can be Christian if they want, so what we talk uh, while we come in uh, atheism or in uh, uh, agnosticism, then our point is to live uh, your life as you want, choose your ways as you want. So this is the really freedom we are talking about. We are not really criticizing uh, only a specific religion. No, it's not like this. And in Pakistan, I am uh, telling, uh, I have told you uh, already that in Pakistan we have also minorities, we have Christians and Hindus, but yes, believe me, they are not even safe in Pakistan. They face discrimination by Muslims. And that is true. And uh, being an atheist, I must say that they are also people. This is their life. This is their uh, religion. Let them choose what they want. Let them do what they want. Let them practice their religion in the way they want. So why we are just uh, pushing them and why we are, uh, we are just them uh, putting pressure on them, just come to Islam. Why? This is not our business. I mean, really seriously, we are living in sorry, in 21st century. And it's not our concern to put pressure on the people that has yes, come to the, I mean, if you think in the way that Muslims are, uh, are the best in the world, Islam is really a peaceful religion, why don't you think that the other people, they are also thinking in this way? Still Christianity, if I talk about Christianity, Christians really think that we are best, our religion is best, then how you can really, put them, uh, 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 putting pressure on them, oh no, come on, this is Islam, and we are opening our arms for yourself. No, for me, religion, it is only a one-sided road. If I talk about Islam, it is really a one-sided road. You can only come there, join them, and if you talk about leaving Islam, then seriously, I'm telling you, you will be in trouble. I have faced it. There are many, many people in Pakistan, they are still facing it. You are born Muslim, that's not your fault, I mean, because you are, uh, yeah, your parents, if your parents are Muslims, your parents were Christians, your parents were Hindus, you will be the same. What is your edge? Nowhere. You have to be that, you have to be uh, Muslim if you are born Muslim. You have to be Christian if you are born uh, as, a, as Christian or Muslim. I'd like to ask um, some of the others to comment as well. Dia, you okay. wanted to say something and Walid yes, also. Uh, just, to, just for the go question go about reforming Islam. He, he speak about reform, uh, reforming fundamentalism Islam. Uh, fundamentalism Islam, it's, what you mean with fu uh, fundamentalism? For me, fundamentalism, it's not only the jihadists. Fundamentalism, this organi Muslim organization, who lead by Muslim brother, they are fundamentalism. When they ask about changing the law with, to be compatible with their own Islamic value, it's fundamentalism. When they ask about hijab, it's fundamentalism. So when we speak about reforming Islam, for me, reform, uh, when using this word, it means that Islam have some wrongs. Uh, it's wrong, I mean. Uh, and this, what they don't accept. Any Muslim will never accept that Islam have uh, has a mistake. So, reforming Islam, it's impossible. Especially in this time. Reforming Islam with this power of money, this power of media, this power of uh, even numbers, it's impossible. And with all these things, 
together. It's like when you, in the dark age when you wanted to reform Christianity and you're talking with the church. It was impossible. It's exactly if you want to reform Nazism, Nazism in the time of the power of Hitler. Just yeah. very briefly what I wanted to say. I think it's a very good question, actually, in terms of how, how does one resist these various forms of fundamentalisms and, and religious fundamentalisms that are rising across the various contexts. Uh, what I would say is I do think that the ex-Muslims or the atheists within the Islamic context are on the very front line of, of that resistance movement. But I will also say I'm actually a Muslim. I will say uh, that there are Muslims on the front lines of, of resisting fundamentalism. There are feminists, there are artists, there are activists, there are so many people who are resisting and fighting and being imprisoned and butchered and killed every single day and people are not giving up. Just because you don't hear about them in the West very often doesn't mean that there isn't not just a resistance movement, but there is, it's an avalanche of people who are pushing back. And, and what's really required from not just this room, but from other people, particularly in the West, is a little bit of solidarity would go a long way. You know, it's, it's not necessarily your fight, it is our fight because you know, we're, we're, we're suffering the direct consequences of this, but to have some allies never hurts. So, so I would say that yes, atheists and ex-Muslims are on the very, very front line bearing a, a terrible, terrible price for their activism, but they're standing in a long line of many other people who are related to the movement of crushing this fundamentalism that's destroying all of our lives, including Muslim lives. Hi, um, my name is Jimmy Bangesh and I'm an ex-Muslim also. I just wanted to um, ask if the panel could touch on, um, well, because we made a distinction about the fear of apostates, um, but I think we haven't really talked about the fear for apostates. So for those of us who are ex-Muslim and we come out to our families, often our parents are so brainwashed into this ideology that they're convinced that now we're going to spend, their child is now going to spend an eternity in hell being tortured and uh, having their skin flared and drinking hot pus and being, you know, uh, whipped by demons. So sometimes that motivation is about being concerned for your child or being concerned for your sibling and not wanting them to enter into this disastrous afterlife. And I think also that mechanism of shunning can sometimes be seen as a mechanism of coercion. So if I disown my child, then it will be so bad for them that they'll come back to Islam and want to spend time with us and they'll be Muslim again. And that motivation is something I think is important not to forget about because it's a much more personal experience than one in wider society. And I was just wondering if panel members have experienced that or themselves. I think, um, um, unfortunately, um, when, when we speak about ex-Muslims, the majority of people who have been tried um, in Islamic countries, um, the people who take them to court are their families. Um, if we speak about, for example, Karim Amir or um, you know other, you know um, Karim Al Banna and others that have been, you know, uh, arrested, um, is their own families who discovered, you know their atheist blogs or their posts on Facebook and they take them to court and even, for example, in some cases they've asked for, for their kids to be executed. So unfortunately, um, I, I think, yeah, I, th I think it can be very dangerous to open up, but I speak about at, at least Islamic countries, you know, it, it really depends, of course, you know, families that are very supportive of their, you know, kids and all that and they have a concern but I think um, it is a big risk. Uh, last year, for example, in Kuwait, there been this guy who's been killed by his own brother because he discovered that he was not fasting in Ramadan. And um, um, that doesn't come from thin air. Of course, it comes from years and years and years of brainwashing and that Islam is at risk and everybody needs to adhere 
to a certain Islam by a certain sheikh, certain understanding, and then if they don't, then it's shameful, it's taboo, it's, you know, al-ar, it's like the worst thing that could happen. is an honor crime, actually. It's, it's kind of an honor crime that, you know, families feel obliged in some sort of way, who think that is Islamically correct, that they should take their kids to a court, they should, you know, you know, kind of, um, you know, avenge their owner on their kids. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what, what, what to say. About, yeah, I think Zara might also want to, I'm um, interested in a moment, sir. I wanted to ask you because Turkey has had this long tradition of, uh, of state-sponsored secularism. That, as you said, they stood aside and watched the Islamists grow, but you, I mean, there have been generations of uh, Turkish people who've been atheists. So what do you think is, is happened? I mean, in the case of, you know, the, the question was about the family and the risks of coming out or being atheists. So what, what, how have things changed? Uh, normally, uh, we have uh, lots of friends, uh, atheists, and when I'm talking with them, um, three of them uh, treated uh, by with their family, they said, uh, we're gonna kill you. And they called me and they said to me, can I stay at your house? I was like, yeah, why not? They will kill me too, <laughs> come on. And uh, uh, two of them has yet stayed at my house and we found uh, them a job. We are still seeing each other, but they are uh, living uh, with um, fear every time. And um, they, they are not using any social media and one of the family even paid the detective to find uh, where he is. And he told me, well, I better to leave your house because yes, they are going to kill you too. Uh, for me, uh, my family didn't tell me that they will kill me because they don't really know what Islam is, lucky me. But uh, my mother told me that he, she wants to go to the government and she wants to erase my name from the family. Uh, I said, why? She said, because you are embarrassing us, being uh, an atheist. I said, okay, uh, who I am? I mean, it's just, I want all the family to know your uh, child can be gay, uh, can be atheist or whatever. This is, he or she is still your child. And I told my mom, if you are thinking like this because of I'm atheist and you don't want me to be your sister, I told her that means you never been my mother. Because if you are a mother or father, you will just love your child because of the way he or she is. Not because of the, what they do believe, if they are following you or not. Uh, in, in Turkey, it's the same. I lost my job uh, two years ago because I told my boss that I'm an atheist and I'm working for, uh, for the Atheist Association in Turkey. She said it's just fine. But that time, uh, Atheist Association has uh, bad treatments from uh, Sharia Association. They told uh, on the video, uh, because of we are atheists, people must uh, make our uh, legs and our hands uh, cross, and they need to cut them because we are atheists. So because of that bad treatment, uh, she's scared and she said maybe they will do the same things to our company, and she said, I'm sorry, but I have to ask you to leave. Since then, in two years, I couldn't find a job because of I'm an atheist. Everybody has scared, and two years I lived without a job, and I had to sell my house because of this. That's the being atheist in Turkey. So just to pick up on what you said, Jimmy, um, what you're describing as family claiming that they love you, I would describe as abuse and ultimately control. Very, very abusive. Um, so they don't have to beat the crap out of you or hurt you physically to be abusing you, the mental torment that you're experiencing because you want to, like uh, a parent-child relationship works both ways, uh, where parents want to take care and love their kids and provide for their kids. Kids also want to love their parents, they want to protect them, they want to make them feel happy. 
For parents to lay down conditions for that love is massively abusive. And ultimately, this push and pull that they're enforcing on their kids, we will love you if you do what we want you to do, that is very, very abusive. And we, we see the impact of that in our everyday lives. When we work with ex-Muslims that are experiencing this push and pull from their family is that if you behave this way, we will love you unconditionally. But if you can't do everything we want you to do, we're not going to love you. The, the, the everlasting impact of that is so, so damaging because then those young people grow up thinking, I have to do everything that this person tells me to get their love and affection. So going forward in their everyday relationships, they take that model into everyday relationships and end up falling into abusive relationships because that's the only model of a relationship that they view is healthy, they're taking into their other relationships. So uh, th these parents are creating very, very, um, vulnerable children and sending them off into the world. Go and make your relationships just like this. You've got to do everything that these people ask you to do to get their love and affection. Ultimately, it's abusive. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Jamal. I'm from uh, Ex-Muslims of Norway. I want to just first say uh, we call ourselves Ex-Muslim because we want to point that there is a big problem to be an ex-Muslim today. Uh, and we want to normalize the acceptance of to left Islam and uh, criticize Islam. But uh, I think in the Western countries, both, both, both uh, left and right political movements uh, slowing down ex-Muslim movement and uh, critics and voices. So my question is, don't you think we have to put to side left and right politics and issues and focusing to critics of Islam to, uh, for to wake another millions uh, and unite? Because there is a lot of ex-Muslims uh, who uh, associating with the rights movements or left movements and so they cannot unite when I hope one day or is it not time to unite all of them my questions so what does the panel think about that to put aside <laughs> left and right politics For, let's make political out of uh, our beliefs that's what I always saying I mean when we are ex-Muslim, we shouldn't looking for the difference of uh, political views. I will work with somebody who are left, who are right. I don't care. That's what I think, personally. I think it depends on what kind of left and right we're talking right, about. Yeah. Um, because um, in recent times, the, the lines have become blurred. Uh, you know, uh, I've spoken to people on the right which, quite scarily, I've agreed with some of the stuff that they're talking about. So it's not as clear-cut as it used to be. Um, but actually, our movement, largely, it is political. It is entirely political. Uh, like, secularism used to be the, the battle of the left, but the left have abandoned us. But then so have the right in many cases, and the right use us as a political weapon. Like, we've got these brown people on sides that, you know, agree with our views, so we're going to use them. They're not, they don't have the same views as us necessarily. So I think it's about looking beyond uh, just the kind of political uh, parties that we're working with and um, identifying what parts of their views are, co are common to our aims um, and just looking a bit further. I would say universal human rights could be one basis on which we can, can do I that work. But I think as Vera well. and Imad want to say something. May I add something yeah. as well? Yes. In Turkey, there is an atheist association. Uh, in, in Turkish, they call atheism Derni. They never involved with any uh, party. They are not saying we are right or we are left. They are just uh, following the laicity. 
But the thing is, on the right uh, parties are always talking about us like we are terrorists. And even Erdogan said on the TV lots of time, they are atheists, they are terrorists. So if someone is putting with the finger you as a terrorist, people are following him and who is watching him is seeing you as a terrorist. I would like to uh, really uh, give you an ex experience, but I will not. I'm just going to tell. If I will just sit uh, there and if I will stand up, if I will say, I'm an atheist, you will just look at me and you will say, mad woman, why you are screaming? But let's try if I will uh, stand up there and, and if I will say, Allahu Akbar, <laughs> even if there is any Muslim is here, they will just run away. So I would like to say, we are not a terrorist. We are working for the human rights. We do not care who do believe to what, if God or Muhammad, Jesus, really, we do not care. But as far as your religion is harming me, my life, and the people that I do love or even I do not know, then, yes, I will put my finger to your religion. And if I will say, what is writing in it? And you're asking to me this. So we are not a terrorist. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Mother, I think yeah. I'm going to have to wrap up if we're going to stick to time. So, um, we will have more time for discussions later. We've got a break coming up soon. I just want to end by saying that it's actually forgotten words in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when, in preparation for this conference, I read them again. I've read them many times, but they spoke to me differently this time, because the opening article says, all human beings are equal in dignity and rights, endowed with conscience and reason. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a document on which rationalism, atheism, agnosticism, and indeed religious believers can stand. It doesn't say that we have to live within a religion. It says we are endowed with conscience and reason. I just want to leave you with that thought. Thank you. Right, thank you, Gita Sahgal, for that panel. Opened up a lot of discussion. Uh, thank you, Adir Khan, for the film you made. Brilliant, thank you. It's brought, uh, actually, the whole issue of uh, um, ex-Muslim freedom of conscience and uh, um, having the right to think independently to the mainstream. Thank you for that. And thank you for panel for a lovely discussion on the various issues of re leaving religion. We're going to have a break, and then we're going to come back in about 25 minutes, if you don't mind. We want to be on time. We have an important panel and discussion on freedom of expression coming up. Thank you.